Let's start with why confidence is so important. Every athlete, wait, scratch that, every person needs confidence. It doesn't matter if you're trying to win an Olympic gold medal, get a job promotion, or just get a date for Friday night. You need confidence. Confidence plays a crucial role in all aspects of success in life. Or in other words, if you lack confidence, success is gonna be really hard to come by in life. Right at the onset of Joe Friel's Training Bible for Triathletes, he writes, Athletic success requires confidence, mental toughness, and patience. You won't achieve your goal if you don't believe you can. And this study on the role of confidence on world-class sport performance says that confidence has also been linked to productive achievement behaviors such as increased effort and persistence. And I don't know about you, but I could use some increased effort and prolonged persistence in my life. And confidence helps increase both of these things. If you're confident, you're gonna push harder and you're gonna go further. I often find myself thinking and saying that big goals equals big commitment, and that's true. But while I was studying for this video, I think that something else needs to be added to that equation. Confidence equals big goals equals big commitment. And what I mean is that confidence is the precursor to setting big goals. Confident people set big goals. If your life is permeated with self-doubt, then you're not gonna set big goals because you don't believe you could achieve those goals anyways. Whereas if you're confident, you actually believe that those goals are possible and you will set bigger goals. And if you don't think that setting big goals are important, then just go back and watch the 10 other videos that I've already done on the importance of setting goals. But confidence also plays a part in the last part of that equation too, the commitment part of it. Researcher Bandura writes, the stronger the perceived self-efficacy, the higher the goal challenges people set for themselves and the firmer is their commitment to them. How do I elicit strong commitment to my goals? It starts with confidence. Let me sum it up for you so far. You need confidence because confidence improves performance. And as my boy MC Spandex reminds us, It's all about performance. That's the name of the game. So what is confidence? Well, here are a few definitions that I've come across that I like. A feeling or consciousness of one's powers, the feeling or belief that one can rely on someone or something with a firm trust, the state of feeling certain about the truth of something. Or in other words, confidence is a mental thing. It happens in your brain. You can't touch it or feel it or pick it up, but you feel it. All three of those definitions used the word feeling at the beginning. It's something that we feel. Bandura, the leading researcher on confidence, or as he calls it, self-efficacy, defines it as the following. Self-efficacy is not concerned with the skills an individual has, but with the judgment of what an individual can do with the skills he or she possesses. Matt Fitzgerald in his book, Run, talks about two kinds of confidence, a mental confidence and a physical confidence. Mental confidence is what the mind thinks the body can do. Physical confidence is what the body itself knows it can do. He explains that physical confidence is an unconscious calculation of your body's abilities that happens in your brain, while mental confidence is the feeling, the conscious feeling, that follows that calculation. Or in other words, when our body and our brain are on the same page, we feel confident. The brain says, we can do this, and the body says, yep, we sure can. However, we all know that guy that shows up to the race a little overconfident who is saying, I think I can win this race. However, as soon as the race starts, his body is saying, sorry, dude, you ain't got this one. And it makes me think that maybe confidence isn't like a light switch that gets turned on or off, but rather like most things, it's, it's on a continuum and we can have too much confidence and we can have too little confidence and we want to find that sweet spot somewhere in the middle. On the one end of that 
spectrum, you've got the underconfident or the self-doubter, who on paper might be the strongest guy in the race and should win. However, he always seems to self-sabotage himself because he doesn't really believe in his abilities, so he doesn't really win that many races. This is being underconfident and it's affecting his performance. And on the other end of that spectrum, you've got the overconfident, cocky guy who shows up thinking he's the bee's knees and he'll blow everybody out of the water as soon as the whistle blows, but then he gets dropped. But however, sometimes this person, this overconfident, cocky person, could also be the strongest guy in the race and still lose because he thinks he can chase down every attack, he thinks he can he can drop everybody solo, he thinks he can just blow everybody to shreds with his legs, and he ends up performing worse because of his overconfidence. He blew up and he used too many matches throughout the race because of his overconfidence. And that too will hinder his performance. And to be quite honest, I think there are a lot of overconfident young people in the world right now. I think maybe social media has a part of this, but Steve Magnus seems to agree with me. He writes, we tell our children to believe in themselves without explaining how to develop that belief. We've fallen for the Instagram version of confidence, emphasizing the projection of belief instead of working on the substance underneath. People are so quick to look confident and like they've got everything together on the outside when really confidence is the quiet assurance that happens on the inside of a person. Magnus goes on to write that confidence actually comes from deep within. He even says that maybe we've gotten the entire definition of confidence all wrong, and we don't need more of this faulty self-belief, but what we actually need is to lower the bar and realize that confidence simply means having security and knowing that you can accomplish whatever is within your abilities. So the right amount of confidence is somewhere in the middle. It's believing in your abilities, but not being cocky. And it's a trusting in your fitness, but not racing like a strong man. It's showing up to a race thinking, I might be able to win this if I play my cards right. There are a lot of different ways to build confidence, but there's one way to build confidence that stands head and shoulders above all the others, and I'm gonna save that one for last because I want you to watch this entire video. Don't fast forward. One pretty easy way to build confidence is through vicarious experience. Listen to researcher Feltz write about this. Efficacy information can also be obtained through observing or imagining others engaging in a task that observers themselves have never performed. Or in other words, if you wanna get good at bike racing, you could just watch bike races to build some confidence. Seems pretty easy. One little side note here is that it helps if the person you're watching is someone you consider similar to yourself. When the person you're watching is more similar to you, the benefit of this confidence building is increased. Researcher Bandura writes, seeing people similar to oneself succeed by sustained effort raises observers' beliefs that they too possess the capabilities to master comparable activities required to succeed. Another way that you can build confidence is through persuasive techniques. Or in other words, we can gain confidence when other people tell us that we're good at things. Listen to researcher Feltz write about this. Persuasive techniques are effective only if heightened appraisal is within realistic bounds. The extent of persuasive influence on self-efficacy also depends on the credibility, prestige, trustworthiness, and expertise of the persuader. So there are two stipulations when it comes to persuasion. Number one, it has to be based off of reality. We aren't fooled when somebody just gives us false praise to make us feel better about ourselves. There has to be some truth behind the persuasion or behind the, the words that people use to build our confidence. Fitzgerald sums it up nicely. Confidence requires an evidential basis. And number two, the one saying the words has to have some credibility or trust with the athlete. This could be a trusted coach or a supportive parent, but it can't just be some stranger on the sidelines. That's not gonna cut it. Another very simple way to build your confidence in a specific area is to increase your knowledge of that area. 
as you study and inform yourself more and more of a specific skill or topic, you're going to build confidence in that skill or topic. Brian Tracy in his book on goals writes, the primary antidotes to doubt and fear are courage and confidence. The way that you develop courage and confidence is with knowledge and skill. In other words, become a student of your passion or your goal. Learn all there is to learn about it. Read books about it. Listen to podcasts about it. Talk to experts about it. Ask questions and dig to the deepest of depths in whatever it is you're pursuing. Now the moment you've all been waiting for. The number one way to build confidence is performance accomplishments. What I mean by that is just do it. Feltz writes, performance accomplishments provide the most dependable source of information upon which to base self-efficacy judgments because they are based on one's mastery experiences. And Bandura writes, the most effective way of creating a strong sense of efficacy is through mastery experiences. Successes build a robust belief in one's personal efficacy. And really what we're talking about here is competence. Real confidence is established in real competence. If your confidence is based off of anything other than competence, it's fake. It's a facade. You're just blowing smoke. So confidence is feeling like you can do something awesome, while competence is actually having the ability to do that something awesome. If we go back to Fitzgerald's two types of confidence, mental and physical, I think what he's talking about is really confidence and competence. Mental confidence is the feeling that you can do something or be successful at something, while the physical competence is your body's ability to actually carry out that success or accomplishment. And how exactly do we build competence? Practice, practice, and more practice. Deliberate practice to be precise. Steve Magnus in his book writes, Confidence is doing difficult things, sometimes failing, but seeing where you lie and then going back to the work. True confidence is founding in doing the work. If we can turn to psychology to learn some things about confidence, we can look at the self-determination theory of psychology, which states that all human beings need three essential things to be successful or thrive and grow in life. They need to be autonomous, meaning they, they need to have this feeling of control over their lives. They need to have relatedness, meaning they are connected to other human beings in life. And then finally, they need competence. They need to be good at the things they undertake. So what exactly does this mean if I wanna be a better bike racer? Well, if there's one thing that I've read over and over and over again in the books and the research on confidence and competence, it's that we need to replicate our races in our training. Matt Fitzgerald in his Brain Training for Running book writes, the best way to build confidence is to perform highly race-specific key workouts during the peak phase of training. And Eric Hyden in his book, Faster, Better, Stronger, writes, your past experience bestow confidence by becoming little coaches cheering in your head. And Matt Fitzgerald in his other book called Run, he writes, nothing can give you greater confidence in being able to achieve a certain performance in a race than achieving exactly the same performance in a workout. In a study using divers, researchers put divers through rounds of four dives and they noticed that confidence had a strong effect on the first dive, but then all of the other dives after that were, were more affected by their previous performance. They wrote, as subjects progressed over trials, performance became a stronger influence on self-efficacy then self-efficacy became on performance. Or in other words, momentum is a real thing. If you win your race last week, you're gonna have more confidence and probably perform better in this week's race. And if you botch the race last week, it's probably gonna have negative effects on the race this week. And I think proximity to your race is also a crucial role in this whole equation. 
I'll use myself as an example. This weekend is the Snake Alley Crit. And I should feel pretty confident going into the Snake Alley Crit because I won that race last year. However, that was a whole year ago. A lot has happened between then and now. And to just give you a brief summary, this spring hasn't been the greatest for training because it seems like I've been plagued with sickness like every month. So despite having won the race last year, I'm not as confident as I think I should be because my training hasn't quite been where I wanted it to be. So it seems that there might be two types of performance accomplishments in this whole confidence equation. You're in competition accomplishments and you're out of competition accomplishments. So basically you can build confidence off of your past race results, but you can also build confidence based off of your training leading up to a race. This article on sources and types of confidence identified by world-class sport performers says that successful results strengthen the athlete's feelings of confidence and contributed to future successful performances. Fitzgerald, in his book, How Bad Do You Want It?, describes this as the success effect. He writes, experiencing success in the performance of a given task enhances subsequent performance in the same task by increasing self-efficacy or perceived competence. So basically, success breeds more success. It's a positive feedback loop. Man, I love positive feedback loops. Another way of describing it is that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. When you believe you can win the race, you will perform in such a way that increases your likelihood to win the race. Alex Hutchinson in his book Endure writes, evidence that what psychologists call self-efficacy or a belief in their own competence and success altered their behavior in ways that became self-fulfilling, like the aggressive racing of Kenyan runners. So we can build confidence by our previous race accomplishments, but we can also build confidence in our training. If your training is just going really good and you're hitting good numbers and you're knocking out the workouts, you can go into a race feeling really confident based off of that training. The same article goes on to write that all of the 14 athletes highlighted the importance of good physical preparation. The researchers from this study also put together this huge chart that categorized all these training themes, which I thought was pretty interesting. Good physical preparation, according to Olympic level athletes, includes things like good blocks of training, enjoyment of the training, meeting their coach's expectations, doing things correctly, executing a program, and consistency. And when I find myself thinking about confidence and competence, I find myself asking the two obvious questions there are to ask. Am I confident? And am I competent? To help us think through this, I've designed this chart. So at the top, you've got am I confident and am I competent? And if both of the answers to those questions are no and no, you're probably a Fred or an amateur, and maybe you should find a new sport. I'm sorry. Uh, you're not good at it and you don't think you're good at it. So if you're confident but you're not competent, you're probably cocky. Your bite doesn't match your bark. Or Maybe you need some humility and maybe you need to practice a little harder so that your competence can uh, catch up to your confidence. Now, if you're competent but you're not confident, you're a scaredy cat, you're timid, you need to trust your abilities and maybe you need to win some races to build that confidence. Now, if you're competent and you're confident, you're a real threat. You're quietly confident in your ability and you know that winning is possible, but not quite guaranteed. Now, if you've stuck with me so far, you should be completely convinced that confidence does have an impact on your performance, whether that's positive or negative. And there are things that you can do to build that confidence, primarily your past race experiences, your training, and educating yourself on your goals and on your passion. However, I want to end this video by saying while cycling accomplishments and having confidence on the bike is really important, there's another type of confidence that I think is far more important, and that is confidence in Christ. Christians have an assurance or a confidence in their faith, and I'm gonna explain that to you now. Christianity is not like any other religion in the world. All other religions in the world have some kind of balance that you have to do. You have to do so many good works and then maybe you'll get into heaven. 
It's based off of what you do. Now, Christianity is very different from those religions in that our getting into heaven is not based on what we've done, because if it was, none of us would get in. We're all under the standard. We don't meet God's standard of perfection, and that's bad news. But there's good news, because here comes Jesus, and Jesus gives us his perfection, and that is done through the cross. On the cross, Jesus, a substitution happens. Jesus on the cross takes our sin from us, and he pays the penalty for our sin, because the, the penalty for sin is death, and so Jesus dies with our sin on him. That's the only way he could have died, is with sin. And so he takes our sin, and he dies on the cross. Now, that's not where it ends. Not only does he take, his, take our sin from us, he gives us his perfection. So it's like a substitution happens. He takes our place on the cross, and we take his place in heaven, which doesn't make any sense at all, but that's the way God has designed it. It's called uh, divine substitution, if you will. And there's perfect assurance in that. It's guaranteed. It's a sure thing. The blood of Jesus will not let you down. When we stand in heaven before God, we can say it is because of what Jesus did on the cross that I can be allowed into heaven. It's not based off of anything that I'm doing. It's based totally on Jesus. And that's where the confidence comes in. Because it's based on something so sure, like the perfect life of Christ, it's guaranteed. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And that gives believers confidence. A really good verse that, that talks about this is Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. That's Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. Now listen to the words that that passage has. It says that you are guaranteed and you're promised and you're sealed. Those three words are some good confidence building words. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, there are all kinds of things you can do to support. First of all, you can like it, you can subscribe, you can share it with everybody that you know. And then if you really like it, you can just hand me over your money at Patreon link in the description. Now, if you're looking for some improvements in your training, I've got training plans that are available on the Training Peaks library. And if you're ready to take your training up to the next level, then I've got you hooked up at Ignition Coach Co, where me and Dylan Johnson are working one-on-one -on -one with these coaches, and they will provide you with a top-notch coaching experience. All of the links for those things are in the description. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one. Yeah.